want to thank you for the opportunity to come and talk today. Um, and I wanted to tell you about a fun story um, where we um, took uh, work where we uh, uh, studied the role of the family of proteins called PKCs in the lung vasculature um, and developed that into a therapeutic initiative and to a, um, a grant um, that's been funded by the state of Colorado and the uh, Technology Transfer Office. Now, the focus um, of my talk is on this clinical disorder, which I've radiographically shown here, that being um, pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension occurs when the pressure in the blood vessels in the lung is increased. And when that's sustained, the proximal pulmonary arteries enlarge, which if we dim the lights, you can see this pretty dramatically. And the distal microcirculation prunes. And the heart, which has to pump against increased pulmonary vascular resistance, um, enlarges as the right ventricle um, hypertrophies under this uh, increased strain. Now, pulmonary hypertension is due to abnormalities of vascular tone and structural change. You can see here, this is a normal blood vessel in the lung, which after exposure to chronic hypoxia, which can occur if you live at altitude um, or in, it complicates most chronic lung and heart conditions, um, you develop really dramatic vascular remodeling. You, you note the thickening of the vessel wall, the vessels become less distensible and they become dysfunctional. Um, now it's, it's clear that the abnormalities in structure are what are the major determinants of the severity of pulmonary hypertension. Um, we've been interested for a number of years in uh, the PKC family, which is a heterogeneous group of uh, kinases which are involved in diverse vascular cell responses. Um, including smooth muscle cells, which are important in the um, pathogenesis of pulmonary hypertension. Now, um, a number of years ago, um, we made the observation, um, we defined how smooth muscle cells can directly proliferate in response to hypoxia, an important stimulus for pulmonary hypertension. Um, this shows lower, increased, uh, lower oxygen concentrations versus a, a proliferative signal. And cells alone um, do not respond to hypoxia. But after this kinase cascade is primed, the cells acquire the ability to proliferate in response to hypoxia. So for a number of years, we pursued a hypothesis that a select group of uh, forms of this kinase family were particularly important in the hypoxic growth of smooth muscle cells leading to increased pulmonary hypertension. And we used over uh, many years a series of progressively more sophisticated and, and isozyme specific antagonist strategies to implicate a few which potentially could be target therapeutic targets. Um, but pulmonary hypertension is uh, complex and um, to ultimately need to go to a whole animal model um, to elucidate um, the role of these individual isotypes further. And, and so this is just a, a, a picture uh, diagram showing uh, the use of genetically engineered mice, which selectively, or the individual isotypes uh, of this family are selectively um, deleted. And then looking at the whole mouse lung response to hypoxia, um, and this has been a powerful tool. These are wild type mice. These are ones that are lacking, you know, one particular isotype. And you can see here the contractile response of the whole lung vascular circulation to low oxygen tension. So it's, th this is a normal response and it's muted here. And a muted response is protective against uh, severe pulmonary hypertension. So it's this kind of work that allowed us to further implicate a select group of uh, isotypes. And we recently um, summarized the work of a number of investigators who implicated a, a select group of isotypes in a variety of lung disorders, including asthma, cancer, uh, lung cancer, interstitial lung disease, as well as um, pulmonary hypertension that could be uh, therapeutic targets. Interestingly, in the pharmaceutical field, Lilly recently released uh, the first PKC 
um, isozyme specific inhibitor for treatment of diabetic uh, retinopathy in 2006, suggesting and supporting the concept that these isotypes are a viable target for therapeutic strategies in vascular disease. Now, I want to tell you um, a little bit how that previous work um, led to um, our attempts to identify a therapeutic strategy in pulmonary hypertension. Um, now, spectrum of disease. You can divide pulmonary hypertension into chronic hypoxic, which afflicts millions of people, complicates most heart and lung conditions, versus others, um, which is a smaller subgroup, often more severe disease. Um, this is where most of the focus has been historically using vasodilator treatments. There are few cures here. There's been a lot of progress. Um, but there's room for um, additional agents and, and, and combinational therapy. There's also an increased interest in the use of anti-proliferative agents to complement these vasodilators. The chronic hypoxic field, the therapeutic options up to now have been home oxygen and treatment of the underlying cause, so there's clearly a large void for a large number of patients. Um, and this, this diagram just reinforces that concept that the real scope of the problem is much larger than is generally appreciated. This um, diagram shows the current focus of drug therapies, but there are actually many, many more patients that have clinically important pulmonary for vascular remodeling that are symptomatic and are not um, currently receiving treatment. Um, because of our interest in the PKC family and pulmonary hypertension, uh, we were drawn to a drug called Bryostatin-1, um, which was actually first isolated from marine bryozoan by George Pettit. In, in, in reported in 1982. And it turned out that it has some very interesting properties. It inhibits cell growth, induces differentiation, it binds to selected PKC isotypes that we're interested in with high affinity and rapidly causes their inactivation and degradation. In vivo, it accumulates in the lung in high concentrations. It has a very long half-life. And we're interested in lung disease and, and, and it had it was used in a number of chemotherapeutic trials by the National Cancer Institute, so there's a large clinical experience in humans. So it has a number of features that are attractive for us who have uh, historically been interested in the PKCs and pulmonary hypertension. Um, and so we've pursued uh, studies to, to investigate um, bryostatin-1. Um, the first was in vitro where we we looked to see what effect bryostatin would have on PKC alpha, which is a target that's important in this hypoxic growth of pulmonary vascular, pulmonary arteries and muscle cells. Um, and we note a tight correlation between the degradatory effects of bryostatin on that protein and the inhibitory effects on hypoxic growth. So it seemed promising, and we um, uh, went to a mouse model of chronic hypoxic pulmonary hypertension where we have the mice live in a, a hypobaric um, uh, oxygen chamber. It simulates living at 18,000 feet for five weeks. And, um, and the bryostatin had really potent attenuating effects on important structural changes that occur in this mouse model. This is the vehicle control, normoxia versus five weeks of hypoxia in this distal muscularization, and that was, you know, markedly attenuated by bryostatin, suggesting that, you know, this drug could be um, uh, clinically useful. Um, and so that led to um, a broadly word worded um, patent um, for the use of bryostatin derivatives to treat pulmonary vascular disease, including pulmonary hypertension, and also cover the use of bryostatin to treat a variety of systemic vascular disease. It covers uh, all um, delivery mechanisms and, and simplified derivatives based on the original uh, structure of bryostatin. Um, and to pursue this further, um, we framed an overall hypothesis that's laid out here and identified a number of key objectives as, as well as other long-term initiatives we wanted to pursue in parallel with a, a, a project that um, we were funded by the state of Colorado and University of Colorado TTO. And you can see here hypoxia and, and other pro-inflammatory stimuli um, <coughs> uh, promote smooth muscle cell 
responses that lead to increased pulmonary hypertension and um, that we bryostatin attenuates a number of those. We've done most of our work in vivo in mouse and we needed to move to a larger rodent species and eventually large animal um, as stepping stones before a, a, a limited human uh, clinical trial. Now, um, let me go back for one second. Just in terms of these um, objectives, um, we needed to discern, um, define certain early and late <coughs> vascular uh, effects of the drug on vascular tone that we hadn't been able to do in the mouse. We wanted to identify more accessible biomarkers of drug effect and disease. We wanted to, we needed to better define the effects of the drug when it's given before the disease onset, during, and late in, uh, in the disease, um, which we hadn't done as yet. And then because the drug is costly, identify strategies to potentiate effects and decrease uh, toxicity. I'm here, this demonstrates this concept of um, the timing of the, uh, the, um, the drug. This is time and this is the disease process. And the slope is dependent on a variety of, you know, susceptibility genes, a balance of cell responses and so forth. And if the drug is given here, it's preventative. Midway, it blocks progression. Late, you know, you hope maybe it can even induce um, regression. These were unknown um, to us. Um, the other initiatives that we want to, um, to pursue are the uh, development of simpler lung target aerosolized delivery which um, take advantage of some features of the drug, the long half-life, stability at 37 degrees, and so forth. Um, and then if we can deliver it uh, locally to the lung, you decrease the um, risk of toxicity. We wanted to, in parallel with our, the traditional bryostatin derivative, test simpler, more potent derivatives. Um, there's a group at Stanford that has developed those, and we've had an ongoing dialogue with them to try and attempt to collaborate on that front. And then to test in a large animal model and, and um, complete planning for the initial human clinical trial. And the reason to, um, that that's necessary is because, um, unfortunately, although our studies are in mouse, the, the mouse is an oversimplification of the human um, lung and the disease process there. And a large animal model's better um, uh, reflect these, um, these le extra level of complexity, so we need to go through those additional steps. Um, so just to summarize our project, we um, are identifying and validating readily measurable biomarkers of the bryostatin drug effect and disease activity. We're identifying combinational strategies that may potentiate the efficacy of bryostatin 1 in vitro and in vivo, because it's a very expensive drug. Um, we're identifying and then validating optimal dosing and delivery in various animal models of pulmonary hypertension, and that we're completing advanced planning and logistics for initial clinical testing in humans. And I just want to acknowledge a large number of people who have contributed to this study along the way. That's, that's it. Any, Any questions? questions? Is uh, Bradstein available? Uh, how, how do you? That's a great. It's a great question. It's um, it is um, it's in limited supply. Um, I've put a lot of effort into that because it's so costly. It currently costs approximately two million dollars per gram. Um, the traditional. It's a very complex structure. Um, and fortunately, George Pettit is still active at the uh, Arizona State University, and he helped me with the early studies and has recently agreed to provide more. He's kind of a, a regional Fort Knox, you know, of the drug, and he's really excited to see it, the field move along outside of the cancer area where he, he studied it for years. Um, so that's one source. There is a commercial source, um, but it's expensive. And then the, uh, and there's another untapped supply potentially at the National Cancer Institute where they have, um, they contracted and purified a large amount of the compound to use in human clinical trials in cancer. And I, I presume that there must be some left that's um, uh, stored there, but I haven't been able to access that yet. And, that, um, and then the, there's this parallel pathway of trying to work with um, you know, an outside group that has developed uh, simplified bryostatin analogs at the 
you know, a fraction of the cost, that, um, it's clear that there's certain structural moieties in the bryostatin compound that give it um, a lot of its favorable properties. Those haven't been characterized in vascular cells. And um, as recently as a couple days ago, um, you know, I had a, at least some email exchanges with them about you know, potentially uh, getting access to those compounds because it would be most efficient to study them in parallel with our, our studies. So we've been spending a lot of time doing that because it is, it is formidable, the, um, the cost of the traditional drug. It's, that bryozoan only grows in certain estuaries, um, certain parts of the world, and there's an elaborate purification process that goes on to, to isolate it. And nobody's trying to grow it in other places than no, it, it's an interesting concept. The, um, the latest I know on that is that it's actually, um, it's actually made by bacteria that colonize the uh, bryozoa. And so there's been some progress at um, you know, uh, isolating the bacteria and the, and, the, and the enzymes in the bacteria that make the key structural components. Um, and so down the road, you could see that as another pathway to production. Um, but it's but it's further away than um, the, the simplified structural analog concept that this one chemistry group has developed. But it's kind of an intriguing area. There's a group at Scripps um, that has been kind of working on that theme. Sounds good.